So welcome to, um, to LSE for this evening's um, hybrid event, uh, which is part of the LSE Festival. How do we get to a post-COVID world? Uh, my name is Peter Trubowitz. I'm a professor in the International Relations Department and the director of the Fallon United States Center uh, here at LSE. Well, we meet at a, at a time of geopolitical upheaval and um, political fragmentation. Uh, Putin's invasion of uh, Ukraine um, has upended uh, assumptions and norms about the international order that have prevailed since the end of the Cold War. And while we booked in tonight's speaker, Dr. Fiona Hill, um, before the war broke out, the storm clouds were already gathering at that time. Um, and I think we could not be more fortunate to have someone with her expertise and, and background um, to help us begin to make sense of the moment that we're in and, and how we got here. Um, Dr. Hill is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. She has served um, several times, a couple times in uh, government. Um, most recently, uh, she served as a director for Europe and Russia on the White House National Security Council uh, from 2017 to 2019. And then before that, she served as an intelligence officer for Russia and Eurasia from 2006 to, to 2009. She has written widely about Russia, the Caucasus, Central Asia, energy, and national security broadly. And she is the author of um, this highly acclaimed, There is Nothing for You Here, Finding Opportunity uh, in the 21st Century. Um, welcome, Fiona. It is great to have you here. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, as well my colleague, co-organizer, and co-moderator, Christina Spohr. Christina is a professor in the Department of International History here at the school. She's a leading expert on Germany and particularly Germany's international trajectory since 1945. She's written many books um, on that topic and more generally on world order, diplomacy and strategy and the practice of applied history. Um, so here's the game plan for tonight, uh, for this evening's conversation. So Christina and I are gonna start by asking Fiona a few questions. We'll probably run for about 20, 25 minutes. We'll start, we've, we've let Fiona know, we're gonna start with a question about the book. Um, and, um, and then we will um, move from there to talking about the war, its causes or its sources and implications. And then we'll open it up to you, both the audience at home, uh, online that is, um, you might not be at home, um, and those of you uh, in here in what is called the Great Hall, uh, the theater here in the uh, Marshall Building. Um, for those of you joining us online, I need to do this housekeeping now. Um, for those of you joining us online, what you need to do if you wanna ask a question um, is just go to the Q&A function at the bottom of the page um, and just please also provide your name and affiliation. Um, for those of you in the theater, we're gonna do it the old fashioned way. You raise your hands um, and an usher will come. Well, I'll call on you and an usher will come by and we'll take questions. And I'm gonna do, Christina and I will do our level best really to get in as many questions as possible. So there'll be, we'll probably take questions in groups. We'll see how this goes. Uh, and there'll be kind of like uh, hopefully uh, multiple rounds uh, before we wrap up um, at um, at 8.15. Um, I think there's just a couple more notes. Yes. Uh, for those of you on Twitter, it must be somewhere already. The hashtag for tonight's event is hashtag LSE Festival. For those of you who have not already silenced your phones, please do that because this event will be, is being recorded and whether or not it ever sees the light of day depends partly on whether there are lots of interruptions and you know whether there are technical difficulties. And finally, for those of you who wanna get your hands on a copy of this very good book, I've been reading it in preparation for this event. 
Um, there are copies in the back of the room. I see people looking at them right now as opposed to me. And, and there are also, for those of you online, there's a link that you can, that'll take you uh, to, I'm not sure where it takes you, but yeah, you know, <laughs> but it, it takes you to the book somewhere. I was gonna say, maybe, maybe anyway, it takes you to the press, I have a feeling. Um, so with that, I think, um, you know, we've, we've got all the housekeeping out of the way. Um, so please join uh, Christina and I in giving uh, Fiona a warm LSE welcome. So, Christina, the first question is yours. Fiona, I apologize in advance. We put you in the center. This is going to be a little bit like watching yeah, tennis. Really so the like questions that. are going to be going <laughs> back and forth. Me. But Christina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Peter and Fiona. It's fantastic uh, to have you here. Um, you all want to get to know Fiona. And I should maybe just uh, start by saying I met Fiona in Washington during the first lockdown virtually. Right. And, um, you know, I'd seen her on TV during the impeachment trial. Um, you know, I had read her books, but then I saw her commencement speech and her life story that she was sort of putting forward uh, was very, very inspiring. And so we had this conversation and it's, it's lovely that to have you here and to, to introduce you all to Fiona, I, I would like to um, ask you, how did you get from what you call the coal house in Northern England to the White House in Washington DC, where you not only advised presidents, but you ended up speaking truth to power, in part as a historian, at the impeachment trial. And given the LSE is an institution uh, of learning, and some of you here are students with your various anxieties and dreams about the future and what you may want to do, I would also like to ask you, what did you take away from your university degrees at St. Andrews and Harvard and your, your stay uh, in the USSR? What did you take away from a la Russian language degree and a history PhD when the world shifted from the Cold War to the post-war world? Oh, well, thank you, first of all, Christina. That's packed a lot into that question. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, I've watched a whole book trying to explain all of this. Yeah. I'll have to try to make sure I um, don't answer for too long. But first of all, it's just one really wonderful to be here. Um, it's, I actually see quite a few people I know here as well. So this is um, really fantastic. And actually, the last time that I was here, um, was for an event at LSC Ideas, and Vlad Zubok, who I see in the second row here, um, one of your professors here at LSC, uh, was part of the event. And actually, as I was coming in, Vlad said, we always get together when something rather urgent is happening. <laughs> and Vlad has written another great book as well, which I commend to everybody, uh, called Collapse, about the end of the Soviet Union. And in fact, this is um, one of the issues that has framed my life, not just uh, my career. I mean, I'm actually, you know, when I, when I look back, I'm kind of amazed that I've managed to still be working with my degree because it doesn't always happen. Now, of course, for all the students at LSE, it will happen, don't worry. <laughs> you won't be wasting your degrees. But uh, my first um, degree, my master's degree was in Soviet studies. And by the time I got the degree, the Soviet Union was on the ash heap of history. And I was already, you know, looking at a kind of defunct degree. So I pivoted quickly and did a PhD in history, just you know, sort of capitalize on the moment. But the whole um, thing that I want to lay out here in response to the question is everything is about timing in life. And I think you know, many of us here, looking at some of the people here who I know, and I mean, Vlad, I mean, tracing uh, the whole um, rise and fall of the Soviet Union in your book, which you lived uh, yourself as well, we're all living in history. So we're all sharing this rather dreadful pivotal moment that Peter just talked about with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, something that perhaps some people thought that they would never see, particularly if there are people here joining us from Russia and Ukraine, the former Soviet Union or the former Eastern Bloc. Uh, there are some of us who sadly saw this coming, although perhaps not in exactly the same detail um, that we did. And of course, um, US intelligence was very vociferous in the fact that this was about to happen. You remember the whole declarations of an invasion was imminent and a lot of people were having um, a hard time dealing with this. But I started um, studying Russian against the backdrop of the war scare of 1983 over the stationing of SS-20 and Pershing missiles in Europe. 
Um, I'd grown up um, in County Durham in the northeast of England. My father was a coal miner, one of many generations of uh, coal miners, until there were no more coal mines that had all closed down. My father went um, to be um, a hospital porter then, right at the very bottom of the economic ladder. And my whole family's life over multiple generations had charted the rise and fall of the coal industry in uh, the UK, and also the kind of history of heavy industry. And it, it took me a while to process this, and this is actually why I started to get interested in some of the subjects I write about in this book, that the northeast of England was strikingly similar to the Soviet Union. So just bear with me for a moment here. <laughs> what? It was um, a former rural area that was massively industrialized in a period beginning in the 1880s, which is exactly what happened in the Russian Empire and the Russian heartland in the same period, and often by the same industrialists. So my area in County Durham has been twinned with Donbass going back generations. And the city of Donetsk, which is being pulverized um, as we speak, used to be called Huzovka. It was set up by a Mr. Hughes from North Wales. And some of you have probably been studying all of this in sort of industrial you know, and economic history, uh, who brought in uh, miners uh, from Wales and Scotland and Ireland, and also probably from County Durham in the north of England. And that whole region was also built up on the back of coal and iron and steel, obviously not shipbuilding because it's um, you know, pretty much landlocked apart from um, on the Sea of Azov. And it had the same industrial profile. And um, when the sort of early industrialists, often foreign, uh, very rarely Russian, mass investment bringing workers over and actually bringing over a lot of the components of production, which also happened in the north of England. And then of course you have the Bolshevik revolution and everything becomes nationalized. Well, that's actually what happened in Northern England as well after World War II. Uh, the industrialists had such a hard time recovering from the war efforts that the state had to step in and pretty much every major industry in Northeast of England was nationalized. So I grew up completely in a, the same sort of environment in, uh, as a, in the Soviet Union with nationalized industry. And of course, you know, the, the welfare state shaping everything as well. So my father went from working in British coal to working in the National Health Service. And I didn't know anybody who had a private sector job apart from the local electrician or the corner shop. Everybody worked for somebody. And that was building up on a feudal system that existed before because County Durham was run by the Bishop of Durham, ecclesiastical church lands, or some of the great landowners, aristocrats of the United Kingdom, people like the Nevilles and the Percys, you know, in, in the Thumberland. And so that's a very similar history to, you know, what we saw in the Russian Empire and in the Soviet Union. So when I got to um, study um, Russian against the backdrop of the, the Cold War, the peak of the Cold War, uh, the war scare, I wanted to study Russian to try to understand what was happening, what had brought us to the point of nuclear confrontation. Here we go again. Uh, we seem to have gone full circle in many respects for that whole period of the 1980s. I went to university in 1984 against the backdrop of the miners' strike, and I got a small grant from the miners of the Donbass to study Russian an intensive Russian language course the summer beforehand, because they'd had a whip round for their old pals, <laughs> going back to the 1920s and late 1880s and 1890s, uh, from County Durham. So I had, it was a very small grant, just to be very clear. <laughs> and it wasn't the KGB, as I thought later, it actually was the miners of the Donbass, because <laughs> people who do research either were unions in, in Russia, heavily manipulated by the state, of course, but there still were unions. And so my very first language course was paid for by the miners of Donbass. So this stayed with me in my mind, obviously, for a long time. I get to the Soviet Union, and as I describe in this book here, I see these parallels over and over again about a deindustrializing state and the impact that this has. And so Vlad talks about quite a bit of this is the kind of the rise and fall of industry and deindustrialization and how that kind of played into um, collapse. And I, you know, like many other people here, lived that as well. And it's really shaped a lot of my outlook. A lot of um, the support that Vladimir Putin draws upon now um, in Russia comes from the old industrial heartland, the Urals, the, the great big tank factories, the places that have not done well out of all of the transformations that came along in the 1980s and 1990s and onwards. And if I look at the United States, same thing kind of happened there from the 1980s onwards when you had, uh, uh, again, all these transformations with the changes in the economy in what was the old industrial heartland of the Midwest that becomes now the Rust Belt. It's very much the same as what I saw growing up in the Northeast of England where overnight mass unemployment with all the privatization of industry in the 1980s. And so I've always been fascinated by these parallels that are historical, uh, but also have really helped to shape outlooks and how out of the backdrop of all of this, 
these populist uh, tendencies came out. And it was as a result of perhaps seeing things in a very different way that I found my path, strangely enough, from the coal house to the White House, because I was always looking for parallels and ties and trying to understand these larger trajectories. And at each time, because of timing, a door opened, a chance to study in the Soviet Union, just as Gorbachev and Reagan are uh, wrapping up uh, the arms control um, agreements in 1987, 98, coming to Harvard on a scholarship um, in 1989 as the Cold War is ending, the Berlin Wall comes down, taking classes when, with Stanley Hoffman, who I'm, I'm in a class on the Berlin crisis, and he's 15 minutes late. And do you do this at LSE? If you, Professor's 15 minutes late, you take off. We're just about to pack up our bags and leave. And he sweeps into the classroom and says, ladies and gentlemen, the Berlin Wall has come down. I'll have to change my class for the day. <laughs> it's supposed to be a class of it coming up and suddenly it's coming down. And so it's all about timing. And I'm sure that there are people sitting here who will end up on a very similar trajectory. It's all about timing, about what we're studying. We're all living in history. We're all part of it. We all have agency. And I discovered that. Um, you know, throughout my life and also being able to apply what I'd studied. And I know that other people here will be doing that as well. Fiona, you used a word that I want to jump in straight away because you have put yourself into the systemic context. And if you look at the post-Soviet trajectory and how we ended up in this war, I would like to ask you, what do you think is the significance of leaders, of power and agency as opposed to systemic shifts? if you think about where we got to today. Thank you. Well, systemic shifts are clearly um, extremely important, but leadership does matter. And I think if there was any argument about that, if you know, people like Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin have helped to resolve that. And I know there's a bit of a leadership crisis going on here in the UK, but I won't, I won't comment on that. <laughs> but we all know it's style and it's really people's personalities. And in the um, person of um, Putin, for example, I mean, we can all argue about whose war is this. Um, you know, obviously there are elements um, that you know relate to much larger trends. And again, I keep wanting to commend bloody Sars <laughs> book um, because I, I just I just read it um, in the last uh, uh, few weeks and finished it. It's a really monumental book, so I just want to commend you again on it. I mean, you can uh, really see how people again are products of their times, and Vladimir Putin has been completely and utterly shaped by the whole experience of post-World War II Soviet Union, born in 1952. And his whole life, you know, basically, he's born in the Stalinist era. And then his whole life basically charting that peak in, in some respects of kind of Soviet power, as some people thought about it in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And then, you know, the trajectory down. The significant part of um, his biography in missing perestroika completely in the hopeful side um, of change coming back because he was in Dresden, in East Germany. Dresden being a very particular place, I'm sure many of you know all of this um, already, but Dresden being a particularly strange place at that time that you couldn't pick up West German television. Um, and so he, you know, people assume that when you know, Putin was um, basically working in Dresden in the KGB and uh, with the Stasi, that he must have known what was going on. And actually all the evidence points to the fact that he didn't. And he actually did not know what was going on back in the Soviet Union because it wasn't like he was getting dispatches. He was there to spy on people, not to kind of read the kind of incoming information uh, from the Soviet Union. And the reason that he says that the collapse of, this, of the Soviet Union is the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century is because it's for him personally, so he thinks at the time. I mean, I'd argue that he wouldn't become president of Russia without that happening. Actually, you can't really, it's hard to imagine his trajectory um, at that point to becoming uh, the president of the USSR. But he sees it as a kind of the loss of that career path that he thought that he was on. And he's also, he's in Dresden at the time when everything's unraveling in the uh, GDR as well. And he says that, you know, basically the Soviet Union and Moscow lost its place in the world and Moscow was silent when everything fell apart. And he basically, he, he's a restorationist as we see, but he's, he's ranged much further than beyond the Soviet Union talking now about Russia, Russian history. And this is where it becomes important as well. So just recently in an interview with the FT, Putin um, pretty much described himself as Peter the Great. That's a bit fabulous, you know, if you kind of turn to think about it. But um, just a very quick uh, story here. On a couple of occasions when I've been into the Kremlin for meetings with Putin, um, part of my official positions, we've met in that great big huge room that you've all seen on, on all the images, the one with the white table, the parquet floor, 
And, you know, most recently we've seen him at one end and it's like they put extra leaves in the table. So he's pretty much over there by Beaver's Brew, the cafe that you see over there, <laughs> you know, talking to his um, advisors. So you can imagine there that it's not a very intimate set of discussions. But that, that room with the table a bit smaller in it, um, what I noticed in the time that I was there was, apart from the parquet floor, the elaborate table, there were four statues of czars. <laughs> And this is kind of Putin sees himself really as the embodiment now of the Russian state, the Russian imperial state, and clearly sees himself because of all of his own personal study of history as a kind of a acting out, let's say, of Russian history. Over his left shoulder, as I'm looking at him, was Peter the Great. And we've already heard that he thinks he's Peter the Great. And he's talking about Peter the Great's great battle um, with Charles XII of Sweden, and as he's talking about the gathering um, or the regathering of Russian lands, I mean, he actually said to the FT that Peter the Great was just taking lands back that had already been given um, to Russia with the Battle of Poltava and you know, rolling back the, the Swedes in the 1700s. Then in front of him, and actually we were having a bit of a back and forth on Ukraine and Crimea at the time, as soon as um, my, my boss at the, that particular period, Ambassador Bolton, mentioned Ukraine and Crimea, he looked at the other statue beyond, but just over there, it was Catherine the Great. Of course, the person who annexed Crimea from the Ottoman Empire in the first place and seized all of this territory from um, the Donbass, Sea of Azov, down to Odessa, um, you know, from the Ottoman Empire and, you know, various other, you know, kind of states of dependency on the other neighbours. And then there was Alexander II, who one might, you know, kind of think this is over here where you're sitting, Peter, you're Alexander II. So you're Peter the Great. Oh. Oh, no, you're <laughs> the great. Yeah, so Alexander II, the great reformer, uh, emancipator of the serfs. That's okay. That was all right. But then, more curiously, was Nicholas I. Now, Nicholas I, for those of us who are kind of, you know, Russian history buffs, is quite a complex character. He's the person who put down the first attempt at a coup um, with the Decemberists, um, uh, when um, a whole um, group of very young um, Russian military officers wanted to have a constitutional monarchy imposed, and there's a bit of a succession crisis. He's then renowned for his repressive actions after that period. He was known as the gendarme of uh, Europe, helping put down the rebellions of 1848 with other European monarchs. He's the father of Russian nationalism, about the whole idea of the autocracy, um, the Orthodox Church and the people being the pillars of the Russian imperial state. And Putin's into that as well, you can see. But he's also known for the Crimean War, in which he overextended and almost lost uh, Russia's possessions in the Black Sea and died during end of in that period of the Crimean War under slightly mysterious, murky circumstances. He got ill and people are not really quite sure what happened. And I'm sure that's not what Putin was thinking uh, during his Nicholas I um, embodiment uh, affairs when he was selecting that statue. I mean, she was thinking about the other um, aspects of um, Nicholas uh, um, the first. But this just struck me in the whole thing about personal selection, the way that Putin thinks about things, and the fact that we were all meant to contemplate this when we were meeting with him. And that gets back to your whole point about the role of the person. If you've got someone like Putin who over time of 22 years in office starts to see himself as a czar and sees himself in this now role of trying to expand again the Russian state, the original Russian state, not the Soviet state, then we're in a lot of trouble. Because what I would say is you can't negotiate history. And if we're dealing with somebody who's become a bit of a fabulist over time, which is not what I would have said when I first started studying Russian, he seemed to be, um, uh, Putin rather, he seemed to be a very practical guy. I mean, he's from the KGB, he's an operative. But you know, now he's gone into a whole different phase. And this is where we see that this is a systemic issues, but sometimes, particular leader, a personality really matters. And I did you know, make allusion to um, Donald Trump, who had a very particular personality and obviously clearly had a massive impact on US politics as a result. I, you know, I would like to pick this up right, right here. I mean, it, it's, a, like, it, it's such an interesting and deep take on Putin. And it, it, it strikes me that it's so very different than I mean, a lot of the commentary that you hear, at least in international relations departments, but I think in the West, is that the West is responsible for this to some degree, that um, NATO enlargement, EU enlargement, 
kind of got into, uh, it just got too close to Putin. And whether you explain it as a result of Putin or Russia's concerns about security or worries about democratization and liberalization on the border. I mean, the, the story you're telling is that, that the roots are, are, are different. I mean, that it's really much more, in a sense, indigenous, but it's also really, really wrapped up with him. I, could you just kind of like flesh that out, maybe juxtapose yeah, I mean, your position? We have to remember that from Putin and other people's perspective, they didn't lose the Cold War. I mean, their view is that the state collapsed. I mean, it came apart because of its own um, contradictions and also because of the actions of um, basically a group of elites, Boris Yeltsin, you know, getting together with the heads of uh, Belarus and Ukraine, um, you know, basically to pick apart in uh, the middle of a whole series of a various elite um, in, in, in fighting, uh, including with Gorbachev and all kinds of power struggles on top of all the other larger systemic trends. And you know, Putin's also taken us back to 1922 in some of our recent discussions. I mean, you'll notice that he's a bit of a political hobbyist. He's always taking us back to these strange sort of times, 988 and the Christianization of uh, Rus, and you know, which is the Grand Prince Vladimir, no longer of Kiev, but Grand Prince Vladimir uh, in Hersonest in Crimea. We've been through all of that, Catherine the Great, Peter the Great, and everything else. But Vladimir Lenin, 1922, he, he blames Lenin for creating the Ukrainian Republic. And also Lenin uh, for creating the Soviet Union in the first place and you know, destroying you know, the Russian empire in the midst of a war with the aided and abetted by the Germans. So there's all of these, there's all these things going on at once. Putin's got a kind of a mishmash in his, his mind about you know, the causes and, and effects here. And I would just ask us to also go through an, a thought experiment. Just take NATO away, pretend it never existed. And then imagine though that you know, European countries at the end of the Cold War wanted to come up with some other you know, economic and political and security arrangements. And you know, Russia didn't really want to be part of them unless it had a special role um, you know, under someone similar to Putin. Because remember, there's lots of revisionist strands going through you know, Russia all the way back to the 1990s. I mean, you know, why did we create, first of all, the Budapest Agreement um, to try to give uh, Ukraine territorial guarantees in 1994? NATO hadn't expanded at that point. We had, in fact, the Partnership for Peace uh, with a whole um, host, including Russia, the former Soviet Republic's part of it. But there was a lot of pressure put on Ukraine, particularly also over Crimea in those early parts of the 1990s by a whole host of Russian nationalists, including Melushkov of Moscow, members of the Duma, uh, the Russian parliament, all feeling that they didn't want Ukraine to get away. And at that point, Ukraine had got um, a, a legacy of strategic nuclear arms as well. And in the early 1990s, there were assassinations of Crimean Tatar leaders. There was all kinds of nefarious activity going on. And just, you know, for some of you can kind of go back into that early period of the 1990s. Um, but there was no hint at that point that Ukraine or anywhere else in the former Soviet space, and maybe even, you know, some of the Eastern European countries would join NATO, the Partnership for Peace. So imagine that Partnership for Peace had just kept on expanding. At some point, we would have come to, I think, a similar kind of clash. Because for people like Putin and the people around him, they wanted to have a specially acknowledged role for Russia in Europe. And in where Putin's basically saying, there can be no other empire in Europe but Russia. And in some respects, the United States, um, in, look, and many people here might think the United States is an imperial power. But most people in the United States don't fully process the fact that the US actually occupied Europe, or at least part of Europe in Germany. But President Trump, we had to explain to him, um, so we occupied Japan. It was like, no, no, we occupied Germany as well. When did we occupy Germany? Immediately after World War II. But you see, that's it, it's not that unusual for people to say we occupied Germany. Yeah, we pulled out after Germany reunified. And so from Russia's point of view, no, you didn't. You've still got bases in Rammstein and Stuttgart, and you're still there. And so Putin's thinking, well, we got pushed back. We had to withdraw Soviet Russian uh, forces from Germany and the Baltic states in 1994. This is the whole period of the you know, complications uh, with Ukraine around the time that we're concluding the Budapest Memorandum. But you didn't go, you stayed. So why, so aren't we just fighting then for who is dominating in Europe? 
The Russians think that the US dominates NATO, but again, if NATO had unraveled and there'd still been, there'd been partnership for peace, eventually there would have been that feeling that the United States was still dominating. And, and if you kind of unpack many of the things that Putin's saying, he's basically saying this is an affront that the United States is still in Europe. So we're Sweden, we're Charles XII, and this is the Battle of Poltava. Putin wants to see you know, the United States out. In fact, told us so, all of us, in December of last year, when we got the two documents from uh, the Russian uh, foreign ministry, which many people said, look, this is, you know, there's so many in these things and these demands that we can't possibly negotiate this. Um, NATO back to 1997 borders, so before expansion, US out of bases and taking its missiles with it, please go away from the sandbox. And then of course, Ukraine not being in NATO. So it's, it's pretty complicated, but it's not if you take a really long view. And I mean, I think part of our problem, I don't want to be rude to political scientists, but it's just you tend to kind of look at things in segments at particular periods of time, not you, but you know, kind of, it's just not, 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 you, and not Christina either. But it's just, it's taking that long sweep because that's what Putin's doing with us. And frankly, other leaders do that too. I was just thinking about um, President Erdogan of Turkey. And I remember that we'd, we'd go to meetings with him. He'd start in the Ottoman period. And he'd kind of go right, right the way back. And you know, most Americans are like, the what period? Hang on. Oh, OK, Constantinople. Who, are the yeah. Who what? Where, where are we? And then he would start when he was mayor of um, Istanbul. People go, he was mayor of Istanbul, OK. And, but they couldn't keep up with him because he was, he was expecting each president who came in or each national security advisor to be just kind of following the thread. And he would complain then that the president um, had bad advisors because we hadn't told him about some higher points of the Ottoman uh, period when we were actually sitting down to talk about something like you know, Syria and the, the, and the Kurds, which actually probably was relevant, but it depends on you know, what time frame here. So this, this is a problem that we're living in um, history all the time, like I said, but we're also living in other people's versions of history and trying to contend with it. And that's what makes it so difficult to deal with. Christina, I think we have time for one more question from you, and then we'll go to the audience. I thought um, that was really nice, sort of we brought out these, we as historians try to get down to, you know, how did the nuances work, how to make sense of the complexities, and then we deal and look at leaders who create their own narratives. And in Putin's case, of course, it is sort of awkward with some of them are sort of circular narratives, like winning the second world war again. Now we are back to that. And we are back to Peter the Great. And we are about denazifying the Ukraine. And we have Stalin versus Lenin. Lenin is all to blame for questions of self-determination. But when we now think of this war of conquest, that is what Putin brought back to Europe. And in doing so, in some ways, he has destroyed or is in the process of destroying not just uh, you know, Ukraine, but the post-war order how it is inscribed in the Helsinki Final Act, perhaps even you know, what we find in the UN Charter. You said um, a few months ago, just when the war had broken out, perhaps we are already in something called World War III. What did you mean by that? And how do you situate this particular war in that more recent history when we had looked forward and there had been talk about the end of history? That was all forward-looking uh, narratives. Look, I think um, a lot of this um, obviously began in 2014. Um, I, actually, I could take us back further, but I won't. So let's just use 2014 uh, for now, because otherwise I'll end up being, doing a Putin and taking us so far back that we're all confused. Um, I mean, 2014, that was the first annexation of territory um, in Europe since World War II. Now, people will argue, well, Turkey went into Cyprus in 1974, but they didn't actually annex um, uh, Northern Cyprus. And also, um, Putin sparked off uh, deliberately behind the scenes um, a war in Donbass, which has been a hot war going on the entire time with very high casualties. So, this is kind of another phase of this. I'm not sure whether this is phase two or three, even, because, you know, we could go back. I said I wouldn't do that, but let's just go back quickly to, you know, the Orange Revolution, Ukraine, um, you know, popular uprising against a candidate uh, for uh, president or a president who um, uh, basically was very close to Moscow. And the consequences of that ended up being um, an energy uh, war, in effect. Um, I think one has to be careful about you know, how one defines war, but anyway, a sort of a confrontational um, event uh, over energy, cutting off um, gas uh, to Ukraine on a couple of occasions. And then, of course, we've also had um, all forms of 
you know, what we often call loosely hybrid war, information war, cyber attacks. Ukraine has been under constant attack for the last 10, 15 years. Um, the NotPetya, um, you know, malware, which reverberated all the way around the world with billions of uh, uh, dollars and pounds of um, effects of things like everything like FedEx to National Health Service, which is all sort of part of a, a cyber attack on Ukraine, denial of services, ass assassinations. Um, all um, manner of uh, disinformation. I mean, why, why are so many people asking questions about should we really be supporting Ukraine? Want the money all being stolen? Isn't it a really corrupt country? Well, I can just sort of tell you that that's something that Vladimir Putin has said on every occasion that I've ever been in a meeting with people. Ukraine's such a corrupt country. Don't give them anything because they'll just ask for more. They're incredibly corrupt. Well, yeah, and so is Russia, and actually so are quite a lot of other places as well. Um, and Putin wants Ukraine to be corrupt so he can be able to sort of bribe, you know, Ukrainian oligarchs and you know, pull them close. So Ukraine has definitely been under a state of siege, but so have we. So have we here as well. The poisoning of Vladimir um, Alexander Litvinenko, the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia and the killing of Dawn Sturgis, a British citizen in um, Salisbury. Loads of other strange deaths here in, uh, in and around uh, London. Constant cyber attacks. Um, the use of money to bribe politicians, plenty of scandals around that here in the United Kingdom right now. We know that people like Marine Le Pen have taken, you know, money from um, uh, the, um, the Russians, all kinds of Italian populist movements as well. The, uh, during the um, referendum in Catalonia, in Spain, uh, the Spanish government um, collected enormous amounts of evidence about a, a Russian influence operation, an attempt to you know, basically sway the referendum. The influence operation, the interference in the US presidential election in 2016, hacking of um, all of the accounts of the Bundestag in Germany, although the Russians didn't release them because they wanted to keep the enmity that had started to form between, you know, the Germans and the United States um, over, you know, the Snowden affair and everything going. And so time and time again, we've seen ourselves under attack for a long period of time. It's war by all kinds of other means, not all of society war. I mean, we, we've given it a kind of a label of the Gerasimov doctrine, because in 2013, uh, the chairman of um, the um, Russian chiefs of staff um, had a speech in which he kind of laid this out. Russians don't call it that, but we've seen you know, hints of this for quite some time now. All the subversion and co co um, uh, covert action and remember, there's also been a firefight between Russian paramilitary forces, the so-called Wagner Group, and Russian and U.S. special forces in Syria in 2018. And don't think that that wasn't known by the Kremlin. So we have been in a state of confrontation. We just haven't liked to call it that for quite some time. And now we really see it for what it is in terms of the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. And... Another uh, point, I mean, this is probably a very academic point, is that, you know, world wars and the way that we look at them have global effects. Well, this is having a global set of effects. Um, food security, um, the cut off and the embargo of the Black Sea um, on grain. And, you know, it, well, does Russia care that Ukraine will be able to um, grow grain in the future? No. I mean, that would be give actually more of a boost to Russia's uh, grain production. And I would argue we'll also put northern Kazakhstan um, under risk as well. And the United States and Canada and other major grain producers won't be able to fill in. So, you know, food prices will remain high. Uh, energy prices. Um, I was at a conference um, at the, over the weekend in the United States and several very prominent energy analysts who actually are not particularly ill disposed towards Russia. So that it's become their conviction that Putin invaded um, Ukraine precisely at this point because of we'd reached the point of peak oil. In other words, you know, the, the period in which the demand for oil was the greatest and therefore Russia's point of leverage was the greatest because demand for oil um, over the future after COP26 and all of the other, you know, moves that uh, the EU and others are making to try to phase out the internal combustion engine, et cetera, uh, engine, et cetera was going to start to kind of come into play now, a long transition, 10, 15 years. But Putin felt that this was the most uh, propitious moment because it was highly likely, uh, highly unlikely rather, that Europe and the United States and others would respond. He thought he'd sanction proof the economy. And actually, he told the Estonians and the Finns uh, that he bought off Europe and that nobody was going to actually do anything. So, I mean, this all part forms part of a picture 
And as you said at the very beginning, you've been saying as well, we're now at a pivotal moment where everything in fact changes and we're into a next phase. And that's the kind of way in which a world war manifests itself. It doesn't have to be, you know, what we saw in World War I, World War II, you know. Um, I'm just basically saying we should think about this on a global scale. This is not just a localized regional conflict. We're going to open it up. That's to... not a very positive ending, however. Oh, no, that's not the very <laughs> <laughs> well, You'll get a couple more bites yeah, of the apple, yeah. so don't worry about because it. Because I do um, think we can uh, overcome this in some ways. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll start um, down here with um, the person in the first row with a black blouse. Yeah, you. Yeah. Yes. Hi, hello. Uh, my name is Olga, and I'm LSE alumna and also an advisor to Ministry of Temporary Occupied Territory in Ukraine. Oh, excellent. And, well, thank you, first of all, for giving this very deep and very detailed analysis. And my question is next. I don't want to be uh, even more... Um, uh, scary uh, around prognosis uh, of the development of Ukrainian, Russian-Ukrainian war, but the threat of occupation and formal join uh, of the Donbass, uh, Luhansk, Donetsk, Kherson territories into Russian Federation is like really probable in the next month is because they could organize the referendum to join it as a federal district. And that means under harassment of doctrine, the, uh, if Ukraine will still fighting and it will count as an attack to Russia Federation, what could be the plausible scenario of the prevention of this actually terrible okay. situation where nothing could be done? Okay, yeah. hold, the, hold that thought, right. okay. We have any students out there? Right back there, he's got his hand up. Uh, I don't know, third row from the back, maybe? You, yes. I stood up, so I'll take it. Um, <laughs> um, I was an undergraduate student here. I'm currently a master's student at SOAS, so LSE can claim the credit later that on. Counts. <laughs> um, I have several friends who are practitioners in the foreign policy community within the UK, and they are very thankful for your advocacy, specifically around background, and bringing that into the UK establishment. So thank you on their behalf. Um, secondly, as an aspiring practitioner within the foreign policy realm, what do you think makes a good national security foreign policy practitioner, practically in terms of skills and expertise and also the value of knowledge? Okay, so that's a very practical question there. We're going to go to the online audience. Chris, great. Anna Astar at uh, Melbourne University, who's studying, uh, doing English studies. Uh, for all the speakers, how do you look at the question of the West's responsibility in the current crisis because of being ready to welcome Putin and the Russian oligarchy without questioning the money and integrity, uh, being too lenient towards Putin and his cohort after 2014, and then also not seeing to amend the system of global security, including the UN Security Council structure during the past eight years? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. The floor is yours. Yeah, I'm just making a yeah. quick point to make sure I um, answer all of those questions because they're obviously quite detailed. You know, first of all, um, what Olga um, said is actually very important for all of us to think about. We need to get ahead of this because I think that's exactly uh, what we're going to be seeing, just as you laid that out. Um, and in fact, we can see the precursors of this going back to the early 1990s, just to begin to be clear when Putin um, wasn't um, in the presidency, of course, and, uh, but under Yeltsin, uh, when the Russian um, parliament uh, made lots of declarations about Russian speakers in the near abroad. And the whole idea that 25 million people had been stranded outside of Russia, and that there was a responsibility on the part of Russia uh, to you know, basically protect Russian speakers, and over time, that ossified, and we started to see passports um, being given. It was one thing if people were stateless, by the way, that's, that's absolutely fine to be able to give them uh, passports, but also the use of a Russian passport as a tool. And we've seen this now for years, and it preceded Putin, and it's ongoing, and we have all got to really get reports of um, uh, Russian passports being handed out, not just in Kherson, but Mariupol, uh, and various places as well. It happened in um, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. It's happened in just every setting of a, of a regional conflict. Back in the 1990s, some of us really worried uh, at the time that at some point, 
there would be this invocation of the right to protect. And here we are, we've seen it. And what Olga says here, we all as an international community and as people who are concerned have to get ahead of this. This unfortunately gets to one of the points that we have uh, from the, the question that came in online, because one of the mechanisms for doing this would be the United Nations, uh, because we would be able to take an issue like this to the UN under normal circumstances, uh, to have a ruling against it and to have pushback against it. I mean, look how difficult it is to get a British passport uh, or a US passport and you know, Russia's handing them out all over the place, but as a tool, um, you know, basically, uh, and as an excuse for pressure on neighbors. And obviously, you know, we, we would need to have an international response to this. And so I actually do very much agree um, with the way that the last question, which is really more of a comment, and actually I think, you know, one that I think most of us would support is framed, that we have a lot of responsibility in all of this for not doing things earlier when we saw these emerges problems. We've had 30 odd years to think about this whole issue of the handing out of passports or the manipulation of citizenship, um, not just by Russia, other countries do this as well. You know, we've all had to deal with the fact that uh, countries like Iran believe that anybody who was born in Iran, even if they're no longer a citizen or you know, um, is an Iranian and then you know, taking hostage um, UK and, and other citizens. There, there ought to be mechanisms within the UN framework uh, to push back against this. And absolutely the fact that we have not um, paid attention uh, to the UN uh, framing and certainly reform of the Security Council has fed into this, as well as um, uh, being, um, as uh, the question um, suggested, very lenient um, on you know, Russian oligarchs and others living here at a time when you know, Russia has taken hostage many of our own citizens, um, has uh, put in jail not just opposition figures. I mean, like Sina Valley seems to have just completely disappeared as of in the last two days into maximum security prison. We haven't done much about that, have we? But they've also taken some of our own citizens hostage as well. There are Americans you who know, have been taken now under false uh, pretexts. There have been Brits uh, and others here as well. And, you know, we've had, living in our midst, without any kind of um, uh, pushback, not just Russian oligarchs, but, you know, a whole host of figures from organised crime, um, people who were assassins, you know, running around um, poisoning people. And we haven't got a grip to that. And Putin um, has taken that as a lesson that we're soft, that you know, we're not going to stand up to him. I think it's one of the reasons that he invaded Ukraine, because he thought we would do absolutely nothing. And so we must not lose our nerve at this particular point. Look, this is not against Russia. This is the particular nature of this regime. But it comes out of these larger systemic trends. But it's run by somebody who comes right out of the KGB. Of course he would do this. There are no checks and balances on the system because the people who used to be checked and balanced in the Soviet era um, are now in charge. The Soviet U Union was actually easier to deal with, easier to negotiate with. You had a Politburo, you had the Central Committee, you had all kinds of structures, you had fail-safes, you had people who actually, there was democratic centralism, they actually discussed things. They didn't just have you know, somebody sitting here and everybody else sitting over there trying to make a point or having everything staged like this. You know, we had ways of communicating. Now we're in a really difficult situation. So we're gonna to have to really you know, start to think long and hard. And I say, in terms of what are we gonna do? We have to get ahead of it. We have to think of every mechanism that we actually have to push back. Now, part of the problem, again, for us is that we don't always mirror the best behavior. You know, so we have plenty of our own flaws and problems. We're gonna to have to be honest about that because when we uh, are engaging with the rest of the world, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about, so why is it that India isn't on the same position and Middle East and Africa? Well, you know, partly they wonder, how is this different from when the United States invaded Iraq? We're gonna to have to go out there and explain it. You know, how are we um, you know, going to explain, you know, what we've done in many other settings as well? Putin's always saying, what about? So we have to deal with that head on. We're gonna to have to be honest about that. And I would just sort of say, you know, the United Kingdom and the United States are not always the best messengers. Perhaps we could ask the Canadians, you know, to get out a bit more. <laughs> you know, the Finns and the Swedes um, who are, you know, explain why they want to join NATO. They're not doing it because they're forced. They're doing this because there are reasons. And um, Christina is uh, partly Finnish. I mean, the, Finland has really good reasons for doing this. They could have joined NATO at any point and they didn't want to. So have um, them go out and explain as well. We're going to have to do a much better job of that. And that gets to, you know, the point about being a good practitioner. You have to be honest as well with ourselves. We have to, you know, look deeper and dig deeper to try to understand how people might think about us as well. 
Um, and we have to then, you know, figure out, you know, how we're good at communication. Those kinds of skills are going to be important as well. I mean, it won't be a surprise. I would suggest that we all have to go out and study history. I don't say we always have to have a history degree, but we have to see those bigger contexts. And we have to have a 360 degree perspective. It's no good looking at things in silos, because then you won't understand why it is that, you know, part of our colleagues in the Middle East would say, well, hang on a sec. You know, you didn't do anything on Yemen. Why are you expecting us to do something in Ukraine? And we're the ones that are going to suffer from all the grain shortages. Are you going to help out? Or is it that you're just going to, you know, um, we, we'll, we'll come forward, maybe support Ukraine, but then, you know, you will pander, you know, to, you know, perhaps um, other forces or your consumers um, will put um, political pressure on you. will step back and you'll leave us exposed. You've done this before. You know, how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to have a larger vision for everybody else to fit into as well. And we can't have that larger vision unless we really take the time to understand it. So I would say taking the time to listen to other people, um, somewhere like um, LSE, and that's great, you've got fantastic networks of people from all kinds of different backgrounds here. Um, I mean, it's a wonderful thing to be here in London and be connected to you know, so many people from um, different backgrounds. We need to really listen and we need to work together in networks and agencies. So another thing that makes a good practitioner um, I think is also seeing the value of networks and collaboration with others. It's all, it's no good if, you know, just doing things in a vertical. And, um, you know, Putin is a very good practitioner of, let's just say, some not very nice things. Uh, and we also have to pay an awful lot of attention to the health of our own democracy. People, if you've got a voice, stand up and use that voice. That's why I've been speaking out a lot, you know, in the US context. It's not, you know, a com comfortable thing to do. But democracy doesn't take care of itself. And unless all of us use our voice, then somebody else is going to take it for us. And there's not many other voices being heard in Putin's Russia today. There are lots of Russians out there who think differently. Many of them are voting with their feet and are leaving. But one person who did have incredible bravery and used the voice, Alexei Navalny, is now God knows where. And he's there because other people haven't stood up and said something in that context. So we've got that opportunity to do that. The barrier of standing up and speaking out in um, Russia is incredibly high, but it's not that high in the United States and the UK, so we can do this as well. And, you know, that's kind of, you're not going to be any good as a practitioner if you don't actually stand up for, you know, what you believe in and uh, working with others um, to push forward on those fronts as well. Amen to that. So um, let's uh, take, do we have any questions on this side of the room? So we do. Um, let's take the gentleman back there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much for your time. This this doesn't really necessarily have anything to do with, with Russia specifically, um, but you talked about narratives. And um, I mean, I think you've been rightfully pointing the fingers at other, the, at other countries. Um, but speaking of narratives, I'd be curious what your narrative is of the US in the Middle East, in Latin America, uh, Assange, there are many examples. What do you say to that as a pr practitioner on the US side? Back there. You don't have to go very far. Right. Perfect. Um, good afternoon. Um, first of all, my name is Julia. I'm a former, well, an alum uh, proudly from the European Institute. Um, I'm Ukrainian. Um, and first of all, I'd like to thank you so much for also informing the public about history, because very often during lectures about, especially before in Ukraine and Russia, is more about politics and most recent events and less focus on how there's history dating back explaining why we see Ukraine the way it is today and what could be this underlying, well, explanation or historical, yeah, timeline, shall we, shall we say. Um, my question is a bit maybe general. But, but short. <laughs> and short, I do apologize. <laughs> uh, we, we have often, I have often also like heard about people asking, well, what about this post-Cold War era, so this post 1990s world and the global governance system that we're in. Um, and my question would be, well, what would be your take on whether we do have the system at all when it comes to security and defense? And when it comes to Ukraine, what kind of lessons could we learn? Also bearing in mind the international relations is responses to such crises and actors being shaped by those crises. Thank you so much. Yeah. And <clears throat> one from online. <clears throat> So um, uh, tonight we're actually welcoming people on the online platform from the US, Germany, UAE, Georgia, Sweden, South Korea, Pakistan, South Korea, Romania, and Canada. 
And uh, the next question from online, uh, from Nigel Duncan is, if Donald Trump gets back into power in 2024, how will this affect Russian policy and the current war, or will it be all be over by then? Or, or, and maybe how will, it affect, how will it affect Western democracies? Um, so you could add to that. We have, um, we have about 15 minutes here. We might have time for another question or two from the audience. But go yeah, ahead. I mean, I'll try to um, answer them as quickly as I can, just to see if we can get some, because we've got 15 more minutes, thereabouts, yeah. Um, look, I think it's a really important um, question about narratives. I mean, we're all, we all tell ourselves stories, right, about who we are, either individually and also collectively, which is why it was important for Yulia and Olga to explain it from Ukraine and give us all the bit perspective of what, where they're coming from in the questions. And, you know, the, in the United States, I think, you know, right now, our narratives are in flux. I mean, just as they are here as well. There's a big debate uh, in the United States going about who we are and what all of, you know, these... Um, you know, various events mean, um, you know, what was the United States doing in the Middle East, um, particularly after the invasion of, of Iraq? Um, it's not necessarily explicable, you know, for an awful lot of people. I mean, there were a lot of people who opposed uh, the um, intervention, but there hasn't been um, a lot of recourse since it. A lot of people are still there um, who haven't been called to account. And Putin, actually, by the way, really emphasizes that. I think that's, you know, some of the problem that we do have you know, getting back again to the sort of meta-narrative about the war in Ukraine, that um, Putin justifies it in many respects because, um, you know, the US did this and, you know, got off with doing it and that all of the consequences that flowed out of what I personally think was a massive catastrophe, not just a strategic blunder, but, you know, kind of an appalling, appalling decision. I mean, I know a million people on the streets of London sharing that same view and, you know, lots of people elsewhere in the world and also in the United States, but there weren't very many consequences from that. And, you know, obviously, as a, uh, as a result of that, there's a lot of debates about uh, the US and the Middle East. Did the US, you know, step in in the first instance into the shoes of uh, the UK, Great Britain, um, the kind of, you know, colonial role that the UK and France and others um, have um, had? What's the future of the relationship of the United States and the Middle East? I don't think we've got a kind of a clear narrative about it. There's a lot of debate, but I think we better come up with some answers as we're talking to our counterparts. And we've got, um, as um, Chris mentioned, people from the UAE, they will have a very different perspective on what's happening in Ukraine um, based on you know, what they thought was happening in the US role in uh, the Middle East. Um, Latin America. Um, the United States is all over the place in Latin America, literally. When I was in government, I was quite shocked. It's called the Western Hemisphere, by the way, in the United States. That threw me off for a while. I was like, isn't the Western Hemisphere, you know, the whole of the West? Oh, no, it's not. It's Latin America. I mean, I, when, I, when I first got to the NSC, I have to say, stupid person, I thought, what's Western Hemisphere affairs? <laughs> it's very general. Um, and I said, but there isn't really a policy. Um, I'll just give you like a little vignette there. Um, while um, I was in the National Security Council, there was, of course, the big crisis in Venezuela, which is still happening. You wouldn't know it, but it's actually still happening. When Nicolas Maduro decided he was just going to stay in office, even though he'd actually been voted out in the elections. And um, when the United States tried to work on a co with a coalition of other countries, it wasn't actually at the United States initiative, just to be clear. It came from Colombia and some, initially some of the other um, countries around Venezuela and European counterparts, because... Um, this again gets to some of the complexities of these. Um, you know, remember the Dutch have Curacao, which is just off uh, the um, coast of Venezuela. There are Italians and Spanish and all kinds of Europeans in uh, Venezuela as well. And there's a lot of concern about the diasporas and you know what would happen largely. And the United States, you know, became involved in this coalition of how to deal with Nicolas Maduro, and it all just broke down as usual into all of these thinking about the United States in Latin America. You know, in the invasion in Haiti, you know, back in the day, interventions in, you know, everywhere from Nicaragua to Panama, and it was just a mess. And, um, you know, one of the um, countries that really foils the whole approach was Mexico, because it turns out the United States doesn't really know what to think about Mexico. It's not just, you know, because everyone goes to vacation in Cancun, but it's all because of immigration and drugs and thugs and, you know, basically organized crime and, Nobody knows how to have a proper relationship in Mexico. Even on trade, you know, we had the, we were having the big debate about turning NAFTA into the US, Mexico, Canada relationship. We were just all over the place. We don't have a narrative. Uh, the people have their narratives about what the United States is doing. And again, this is playing out in Ukraine. 
because the narrative about Ukraine that we should be listening to is about Russian uh, making a colonial grab uh, for Ukraine, for bringing you know, back territory uh, and denying the right of people in Ukraine to say the Ukrainians and kind of have a different um, you know, view of their um, identity and their future, not wanting to belong to somebody else's past. But the United States is all bogged down in, uh, in, in past and in, you know, past uh, interventions in you know, places like the Middle East and Latin America. And we don't have a narrative about how we fit in there. And we're, we're in you know, kind of flux about this as well. And I mean, this really gets into, you know, Yulia's point as well, because uh, we've got so many competing narratives and different perspectives. Um, it, it makes it very hard to think about where and how we're going to start with creating security um, uh, for Europe and you know, globally moving forward. Finland would tell you that European security mechanisms now failed. The, that's why Finland wants to join NATO because they see that as the last entity, the last institution is still there. They don't want to take um, NATO back to the Cold War past, but they're just looking for some mechanism. They're trying to think about um, how do we build security uh, moving forward? But if we start to think about all the things I've talked about, we need a 360 degree perspective on security. We can't just have European security existing in a vacuum. It never did. And that's, you know, kind of basically what Russia is banking on, that everybody will see this security crisis as being just about Europe, when it's actually now a global security crisis. And as the question, you know, previously online uh, stated about a, a, a a problem with the United Nations system as it now is, the United Nations um, Security Council. But there is one element um, that is still enshrined in the United uh, Nations Charter, which is Article 51, the right for self-defense. I think everybody, every country agrees that there is the right for self-defense. So then how do we maybe perhaps build off that looking forward in the future? That's extremely difficult. Now, if Donald Trump comes back <laughs> in 2024, I will be moving back uh, to the cupboard <laughs> under my mother's stairs. Uh, and I've got that, you know, my little Harry Potter um, uh, mattress. I've got that kind of planned out. Um, because, um, well, we'll definitely be in a lot of trouble. I think I've made that clear in some other of my um, commentary. And Putin is probably banking on that right now. He's banking on major political changes in, in, in other countries that take us out of action. And, you know, unfortunately, maybe he's made a good bet. So I would actually basically say that we probably should need some contingency planning. That's what Putin is, is a contingency planner, by the way. His goals haven't changed in Ukraine. He's just trying to adapt to them. Um, he's got plan A, B, C, D, E. And we need that kind of uh, plan as well. If Trump comes back in uh, 2024... I think, you know, the, the rest of the Western lines is going to have to figure out how it moves on, you know, without looking to the United States leadership. That's long past anyway. We should, um, people should have been doing that anyway. Uh, not, you know, having massive arguments about who should lead, but how do we put back again, you know, collective uh, engagement here? Um, you know, we can't have 70 years of just, you know, looking to the United States in any case. Um, and we're all in this together. We need to have a much more networked, you know, reframed view of security and how, you know, countries are really, you know, pooling uh, uh, resources. And I would look to the Finns, <laughs> the Swedes and, you know, others to give us some ideas um, about this. I'm not just doing this because I'm sitting next to Christina, <laughs> but I would just, um, you know, commend the Finns for really kind of thinking ahead. And, you know, they gave us in the 1970s, you know, kind of an impetus towards um, Helsinki and the final act and, and a re- configuration of rethinking about security. We need that kind of broader perspective. Let's all be more like Finns for the future. That sounds that like an positive. entree to Mary. <laughs> Mary, I'm gonna, you've waited very patiently. Yeah, so. it's, like, it's very nice to see you, Mary. <laughs> yeah. So much. I, I have lots of questions, but I will have to find another time to ask you them. Indeed, but, one. Oh, one. You know, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So the question, but the question I really wanted was going back to the beginning, because you fascinatingly talked about Putin. But I was thinking about your childhood in um, Durham and the similarities with the Rust Belt and the Donbass. And so isn't there something systemic about Putin, Trump and Boris Johnson and wouldn't, mightn't we have had somebody just like Putin if it hadn't been Putin? I think I'm going to let you respond to that, that question. That's a really useful question, it seems to me. Yeah, look, um, yes, in some respects. But we got Putin from the KGB, which gave it a very special twist. 
And I think there are plenty of uh, people that we can think of in the Russian context for him from his generation uh, that might have had you know very similar sort of perspectives on Russia's role in the world. That feeling of loss again. Remember that Russians felt an incredible sense of loss at the end of the Soviet Union. I'm thinking that everybody else gained something out of this. We might disagree with this, but that's you know the way that they felt there. And look, we've had plenty of imperial hangovers here in the UK, and I would say that the United States has got one too. We never quite uh, realised it was an empire, but it's definitely got a lot of imperial hangover going on here. But Putin, I think, is also quite specific in in his certain attributes and in his worldview, and so a lot of the people around him. I mean, the people around him who helped plan this war, Mr. Patrushev, Mr. Portnikov, you know, um, Shoigu, Grasimov, they're all from a, a similar kind of background. There are, you know, other Russians from that firmament, I mean, including Yeltsin himself, who wasn't really quite on that same page. Um, he, he also didn't believe that Russia should lose its place in the world, but I don't think he would have invaded Ukraine. And, you know, if we think back to some of the other people who could have been picked instead of Putin. Boris himself wouldn't have done, would he? Now, we actually, interestingly, have Sergei Kerienko still running out there, who at one point was a deputy prime minister, and I wonder if he's trying to make a bid for being the successor. And I do wonder to myself, what would Sergei Kerienko do? Sergei Kerienko is from that same stable of people as Boris Nemtsov and um, uh, Grigory Evlinsky and, and others. And he's clearly walking the walk and talking the talk of the people around Putin, but he, you know, he does have a different perspective and a different out, out, outlook. He didn't miss Perestroika. He was there in, in the middle of all of these things. We saw Dmitry Medvedev, who's still there and, you know, voicing the same things that Putin is, you know, different, slightly different generation, my generation, who had a very different perspective in the time when he was president as well. So although I, I'm not so sure that the larger contours of foreign policy would have been that different, there's still have been a lot of desire to, for a kind of restoration, a kind of return to, in some respects, how things were before the collapse. I don't know whether there would have been the same hell-bent determination that Putin clearly developed over the last several years to invade Ukraine and to pulverize the place. And this insistence that everybody should call themselves Russians, because that seems to have come out of a certain, you know, kind of group of people around Putin. The way that he also emphasized the Orthodox Church. And frankly, the patriarch Kirill is just as guilty of all of this. People say that the Putin's weaponized the church. No, I think Kirill has also weaponized the state. And I'll give you just a little vignette for this. Um, I went to a conference once where Kirill was speaking. And this was um, during uh, the time when one of uh, the British um, bishops, it might have been the Archbishop of York, was sleeping in the cathedral or the minster uh, on the floor to draw attention to the plight of the homeless in the United Kingdom. Sleeping on a sleeping bag, you know, kind of on the cold floor. And somebody in the group asked, Kirill and uh, the Orthodox Church, what they thought of this, and you know, would they join in solidarity? The people next was just locked at us and said, What? Are you insulting the patriarch? Um, of course he wouldn't. That would be beneath the dignity and the power of the church. But well, no Christian fellow feeling there for the homeless, I guess, you know, it's kind of very different perspective on things. And 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 we got into trouble for the fact that somebody actually asked this question. And you know, Kirill is all in on this. And it's, the, that, it's that power of the state. And Putin, just to put again this in perspective, said many times that he thought the Bolsheviks, Lenin again, mm -hmm. made a huge fatal error in uh, basically secularizing the state and removing the Russian Orthodox Church as an instrument of state power. So, you know, this is, you know, where we are. But other people don't think like that. They're, they're, this is not just... Um, this, this is not the Russians writ large. This is not members of the Russian Orthodox Church writ large. And although you know, we seem to be having you know, a lot of support for this special military operation, I don't think a lot of people are really you know, fully thinking it all the way through. And I do think that, yes, systemically, there was a lot of problems there. But there's something specific about Putin and some of the people around him who made this you know, decision to go in this particular direction. You know, I want to also go back to the beginning of the conversation and actually... Um, so much of the book is about those who have been left behind and you know and i i want to hear your thoughts and maybe we'll sell some of your books but you know in the process but um the reflections at the tail end of the book about what needs to be done not to deal with putin but to improve our you, you made several references 
this evening to, we need to kind of take care of our own home, fix our own home. There needs to be much more emphasis on the domestic side in the UK, in the United States. Um, in fact, you call for, this is, I think two weeks ago was the 70th anniversary of the, the Marshall Plan, right, the announcement, right. the, the, the Harvard speech announcing it. And you call for a Marshall Plan of sorts yeah. uh, inside the United States. We have a couple minutes left. I'm wondering if you could kind of flesh that out a little bit. Yeah, look, it's that sort of idea. It's not the Marshall Plan per se, but um, you know, in the 1990s, I and many people here, you know, were heavily um, involved in you know, this whole thinking about the transition um, in Russia and other former Soviet states. And we thought about it obviously in a development perspective and brought all kinds of tools to bear that we developed after, after World War II you know, the setting up of the World Bank and the International Financial Corporation and then the EBRD, which is, of course, later on in the 1990s, uh, to try to tackle the same things. And growing up in the northeast of England, I kind of thought we could have done with some of that there as well. And not just in the northeast of England, all over in, uh, you know, the UK and also in the United States. When you think about many of the programs of the World Bank or the US Agency for International Development, you know, some of those would be very useful in places like Appalachia. I mean, I will say that, you know, the very first time that I went down to the Mississippi Delta in the US, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. I mean, I've seen plenty of poverty and experienced it personally here in the UK, but I've never seen anything like that in, in the US. And I saw people living in tar paper shacks or in shanties that have no connection to any kind of sewage, um, let alone electricity and indoor plumbing, but nowhere anywhere near a sewage line. And, you know, you can read about this all the time. And it's an absolute, and utter, it's not just a tragedy, it's a disgrace. You know, when you have people living in, you know, second and third world conditions in, you know, one of the richest uh, countries in the entire world. And look, here in the United Kingdom, there actually is now a kind of development agenda with the um, white paper that the government put out recently on levelling up. I wouldn't have called it levelling up, but it's the same, you know, kind of concept of trying to kind of bridge the divides. I mean, it really is a development paper as well. It's a pity it wasn't, you know, written years ago. But there actually is a blueprint and a kind of an idea there. But it's not going to be the government that does that a lot of the time we're going to be waiting around you know for um a long time if people don't start to act upon this themselves and so one of the things that i did at the back of the book was talk about things that we could all do you know to uh, to step up everyone here has got agency everyone can do something and people like olga and yulia who are from ukraine that's why ukrainians are showing us right now you know they, they, they weren't just waiting around for all of us to kind of step in and help this is an incredibly horizontal network society um, that is forging itself in adversity. And even as Russia is pulverizing the place, you've got volunteers out there rebuilding and cleaning up some of the sites. Well, you know, we need to take a bit of a leaf out of that book as well. This is an existential crisis for Ukraine, but we could find ourselves in the same kind of existential crisis with the polarization of our politics and as people take action as well. We've got all kinds of think tanks and organizations, but individuals at a network can do things. I think universities have a very important role to play here as consciences and uh, conscious, I can't say the word now, consciences <laughs> and, you know, moral authorities, and also as engaged citizens. Um, there's a really unique, um, I, I think, opportunity of being a student at a place like LSE or any of the other um, universities around London to just do outreach, um, outreach to schools. Um, I was um, speaking yesterday at the Harris um, Federation, and have a network of um, schools that have been um, set up by Lord Harris, who had himself a kind of a rags to riches um, story, you know, for kids who were on um, free school meals, you know, across London. Uh, they set up a sixth farm. I spoke at their sixth farm in Westminster yesterday, and I was just really impressed by the whole network. That's why I wanted to speak there and just say, look, you guys can do this as well. You can go out there and you've had this incredible opportunity to be able to come to this school that's giving you, you know, a chance. But create these networks here and go out and do something yourselves as well. And I mean, if we look at this from a development perspective, create the same, that's why I mentioned the Marshall Plan. I mean, the Marshall Plan after World War II wasn't just about transfusion of, um, of cash for um, recovery. It was also meant to spur action on a country level to be able to kind of think about the development exercise to push back the risks of political extremism and polarization. It was a political project. And that's where we are right now in the UK and in the United States. We're in danger of eating ourselves alive uh, from political polarization, all kinds of crises. And uh, we need a broader development perspective for ourselves as well. And we're all part of that. So you can do things, you know, with local community organization. I'm sure a lot of people here are already doing that. You can do it in a larger, you know, foundations and charities. 
but we can all do something and we do something personally. And in a way, I wrote that book as a challenge to myself. Yeah. And, and that's the tragedy of Russia right now because all of those kinds of things were happening in Russia behind the scenes as well. You could go out to the Russian regions and see amazing things being uh, done by citizens. And Putin has now repressed people to so much um, that I really worry about the sort of stifling. We don't think of civic society or civil society is in the political means, but the, the people who would take Russia forward into the future. Ukraine is being forged in adversity in doing this now, but you know we have to think about that ourselves. If we don't do something, we're just waiting around for the government to do something. Things will not happen. We've got to generate that as well. That is a great place to leave it. Fiona, thanks so much for coming here to share your thoughts about Putin, the war in Ukraine, and this kind of state of play in Western democracies. You're welcome back at LSE. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Christina, thank you so much as well. <laughs>